Question 81. Doug Smith, a portfolio manager, created the following portfolio. So we've got two securities, A and B. We've got our expected returns and expected standard deviations. If the portfolio of the two securities has an expected return of 16%, the proportion invested in security A is closest to. So we're going to be using um, our weighted average formula essentially here. So let me make this a little bigger. So our return is going to equal the weight of security A times the return of security A. And then adding that to 1 minus the weight of security A, which will give us the, the weight of security B, uh, multiplied by the return of security B. So we're solving for the weight of A um, because we're given everything else in the formula. Um, so what that ends up looking like is we just need to plug these in and then do the algebra essentially. So we got 16 as our return and that equals 18x. So x is our wa, which is what we're solving for. And then return of a is um, 18 given here. And um, we're, we're ignoring standard deviation for this, for the purposes of this question, because it's not relevant. Um, and that gives us plus uh, 15 times one minus x. Um, so that gives us 18x plus 15 minus 15x by uh, moving 15 into both, multiplying 15 by both of these variables. Um, so when we then um, multiply or add and subtract out the x's and the non x's, we get 1 equals 3x. So x is going to equal uh, one, divided by, 1 divided by 3 or 33%, um, which gives us answer A. And if you wanted to double check this, you could always go back and plug this into the original formula. So you could do um, 0.33333 times 18% plus 0.666667 times 15%, and you should also get um, 16 as well. Question 82. Which section of the investment policy statement describes the custodian of the client's assets? So we've got A, introduction. Um, the introduction is going to provide a general overview of the of the IPS, um, like purpose, objectives. It's probably not going to have granular information like custodian um, and where assets are held. So I think we can rule out intro. B, investment guidelines. The investment guidelines are going to be more focused on asset allocation, what asset class can be used, um, and kind of how tactical you can be and what um, basically anything investment related um, it's going to be more investment specific in, in the investment process and philosophy and that types of stuff, not necessarily operational or administrative stuff like custodian assets. So I think we can rule that out too. Let's make sure C sounds right. Statement of duties and responsibilities. This seems more right more in our wheelhouse. This is going to provide um, all the parties involved, including third parties um, and their responsibilities. So custodian is a third party and they're storing the client's assets, which is their um, responsibility. Uh, so I think we can confidently go with C here. Question 83. Invest Capital's risk manager is considering a three-month call option strategy on a company's shares. The share price of the company today is USD 80 per share. The call option on the company's shares is $2.50 with an exercise price of 88.40 per share. If at maturity the company's share price is $95, the profit per share of the strategy is closest to. So I'm going to pull in our um, call option formula here. So we're going to be taking the maximum of zero and then um, the strike, uh, sorry, not the strike price, the price of the underlying at maturity or currently uh, minus the strike price. So our price at maturity uh, is going to be this $95. And we know right off the bat, uh, since our exercise price is 88, we're going to be in the money. Um, so we're going to subtract out that exercise price. Um, and then at the end there, we need to subtract out the call price. So this is going to be subtract. This is outside the parentheses since we subtract it, whether we're at zero or the positive number here. Um, so since we are at a positive number here, we know we're not going to be um, have a zero price. Um, so we can basically last thing we need to do is take the difference between these two, which is 6.6, .6, and then subtract out the premium that we paid for that call, which is 2.5. And then that's going to give us our profit per share of $4.10, which would be answer B. 
Question 84. Malala Pham is an equity analyst. Her supervisor has given her the task of deriving the beta of a stock from the cap M. What is the value of the beta if the risk free rate is 3%, the expected return of the market is 14%, and the return on the stock is 11.8%? So let's pull in our cap M formula. So our cap M formula is going to be the expected return of the stock, which would be 11.8%, um, which is going to equal the risk free rate plus x which is our beta times the mark equity risk premium of the market so we're going to take 14 percent minus that risk free rate of 13 percent that's going to be our equity risk premium so we get uh, we subtract three from this side we get 8.8 .8, and then we get um, x times 11 for this side so we get 8.8 .8 equals 11x do our algebra out we get x equals 8.8 .8 divided by 11 or 0.8 which is going to be um, answer C, 0.8 for our beta. And I guess one other thing to mention here, um, if you were trying to do this a little quickly, you could kind of notice, okay, this return, of the, the expected return of the stock is 11.8%, and then the return of the market is 14. So it kind of has, to, it has to have a beta below one in order to have a return below the market. Um, so if we were doing that quicker, if you were pushed for time, you could just kind of quickly go with C there. Question 85. Kate Williams is a portfolio risk analyst for Hampton Funds. She is assigned to calculate the beta of Lion Incorporated shares. What is the beta if the standard deviation of market returns is 19% and the covariance of Lion's returns with the market is 0.163? So our formula we'll be using here is going to be our covariance. So we've got covariance between the asset and the market, which we are given at 0.163. And then um, we're given the standard deviation, but we need to convert that to variance. So we do that by squaring it. So we're gonna have 0.19 or 19% down here. We're gonna square that. Um, so when we run that through, here's what that looks like. We've got that covariance we're given. Then we need to square our standard deviation to get variance. We get 4.5152. Um, there's probably just some rounding differences here, so we can go with answer B. Question 86. The feedback step least likely assists in rebalancing the client's portfolio due to change in. So the feedback step is going to be related to the client's portfolio and is essentially telling us what needs to be bought or sold based on what is kind of out of balance. So if you have a equity portfolio or an equity bond portfolio that's normally half stocks, half bonds, um, but that now... Um, because of changes in the market, um, it's 60% stocks, 40% bonds. We need to sell 10% from stocks and move that to bonds to bring it back into balance. Um, so let's look at these, and two of these will tell us if we need to rebalance, essentially, and one will not. So A, security prices. Um, this will be part of the rebalancing process if prices of certain assets that you hold, so in our previous example, stocks, have increased more than bonds or bonds have decreased, then um, those price changes are essentially going to tell us what we're over or underweight. Um, so since this will assist us in rebalancing, we're looking for least likely. So we can go ahead and rule out A. B, asset weightings. This is going to be the same thing as A. Um, our asset weightings are going to tell us whether we're out of or in um, balance um, for our strategic asset allocation. So we can rule out B as well. And then C, circumstances of the investment manager. Um, this is going to tell us, this is going to be more security selection related. So what we're looking at for rebalancing is more high level asset allocation. Um, what's the amount of stocks and what's the amount of bonds? And then circumstances of the investment manager, that's going to be more so, okay, what fund or ETF are we holding in our the stock portion of the portfolio or the bond portion of the portfolio? Um, so this is not going to be related to um, asset allocation as much, which is what we're looking at for rebalancing. Answer C. Question 87. At the beginning of the year, 2010, an investor deposited $25,000 in his investment account. He generated an investment gain of $4,000 during the same year, which resulted in an ending account balance of $29,000. In 2011, the investor withdrew 12,000 from his account at year end. At the end of the year 2012, the investor deposited further a 20, uh, a further 5,000. Sorry, 
In 2013, no further transactions were made and the value of the investment account at the end of the year was 20,000. The IRR of the investment account is closest to. So what we can do here to calculate the IRR is we're gonna be plugging in our cash flows into the calculator and these are what those cash flows are gonna be essentially. So we're gonna be doing minuses for all the deposits and then um, positives for the withdrawals or money we're taking out since that's money we're receiving. So we're gonna have a deposit of 25,000 initially, that'll be our minus, and then we withdrew 12,000, uh, which would be a positive cash flow for us. Uh, and then we deposited 5,000 again the next year, so that'll be a minus, and then cash flow three, that's gonna be at the end, that's just gonna tell us what our ending value is. So we can plug all those into our calculator and then we will compute IRR, and that's gonna tell us what we have. So I've got all these plugged in here. Um, so we can, I'll just kind of skip through this quickly, but yeah, I've got all these plugged in. You will wanna plug those into your calculator, make sure you have no other cash flows in there. Um, and then we'll go to the IRR button, hit compute, and we can see we get answer B, 3.44%. Question 88, which of the following is not a true statement about VAR? So two of these will be true statements and we're focused on that not, so which of these is not a true statement? A, uh, a VAR, sorry, answer A, a VAR measure does not tell us maximum loss. So we can rule this out since this is a true statement, VAR is giving us a minimum loss that's expected at some probability, but it doesn't tell us um, how long the distribution the tail of that distribution is, which would be kind of our max loss value. Um, B, a VAR measure focuses on the right tail of the distribution. Um, this sounds like it can be our correct answer uh, because VAR is gonna be focused on the left side. So if you remember our distribution, so if we draw a rough curve here, pardon my drawing, um, we're gonna have our axis here, and this is gonna be zero. This is gonna be positive values this way. We'll have negative values this way. VAR is measuring negative values, so what are our potential, what's our minimum expected loss gonna be, which is gonna be focused on that left tail of the curve. Right tail is gonna be focused on positive returns. And then C, VAR is subject to the same risk model, model risk as the derivative pricing model. Uh, we can rule that out as well, since this is a true statement. They're both gonna be subject to um, risk of assumptions or estimations being incorrect in the real world, um, which is always a risk with any model. So we'll stick with answer B. Question 89, Sasha Gable manages the portfolio of a pension fund which is equally invested in equities and real estate. The correlation between the two securities is 0.1. Details concerning expected annual returns and the standard deviations are summarized in the exhibit below. Uh, so we've got equities and real estate, expected returns, and then expected standard deviations. Um, holding all else constant, if Gable decides to increase the weight of equities to 60% by selling real estate, the portfolio standard deviation will, in percentage terms, increase uh, by 3.38%, decrease by 12.18%, or decrease by 14.44%. So what we're gonna be doing here is we're gonna be using this really long formula um, to calculate the standard deviation of the portfolio, and we need to calculate it under two scenarios. Um, so under the first scenario, we're holding equal equities in real estate. So we've got 50-50 in each, and that's gonna be scenario one. And then in the other scenario, we're gonna have 60% um, equities, 40% real estate. Um, and so just to point out, if we're selling real estate and going into equities, we should expect our standard deviation to decrease because we're going from a higher standard deviation asset to a lower standard deviation asset. Um, so we can probably rule out A right now and just figure out how big that decrease will be. So I'm going to walk through these variables, I guess, and then we'll pull in the other stuff to, and you can look at the calculation more so yourself. Um, so for portfolio standard deviation, we're gonna be taking the square root of all this stuff here. So we've got the weight of security one times by, multiplied by the standard deviation of security one, 
and that's going to be we're going to square both of those uh, independently and then multiply them together. So we'll use equities as our weight as our security one. So we're going to be plugging in um, our weight. Sorry, I didn't mean to highlight that. So we're going to be plugging in our weight, which is going to be 50% at first and then 60% in the second scenario. And then multiply that by our standard deviation squared. And then same thing for real estate, we'll be doing um, the weight of 50% multiplied by that standard deviation of 13.8%. And then uh, add that to all this, will kind of be in parentheses by itself. Um, and then so two times the weight of each of them, so we'll have 0.5 times 0.5 um, times the correlation, which we're given at 0.1, which that would be constant through both scenarios. And then multiply by the standard deviation of each, so we're given that. Um, so let's pull in those two scenarios and then how we'll calculate that difference here. So we're going to be using 50-50 in those, the first scenario, um, plugging in 5.7 here, 13.8 here, and then you can see where those all flow through again. So we've got 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times that correlation of 0.1, and we'll see that stays constant here. And then um, those standard deviations pop up again. So the only difference here is we've got 0 0.6 and 0 0.4 instead of 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Um, that reflects down here as well. So our portfolio standard deviation starts at 0 0.0772 and it decreases, which we were expecting, down to 0 0.0678. Um, so then what we can do here is we're just doing our uh, typical formula to figure out the difference there. So we can take the ending value divided by beginning value minus one. Um, so you can see those are just plugged in right here and that gives us minus 12.818%. So it decreased by 12.8%. Answer B. Question 90. Stock returns are usually negatively skewed. This statement implies that. Um, so I'm going to pull in this chart from Analyst Prep website and just show what that negatively skewed distribution looks like. So negatively skewed essentially means that we have a longer tail than on the positive side. Um, but because our mean is over here, most of the... Um, most of the returns are positive essentially, but then when we have negative returns, they're really big. That's kind of what we're looking at here for negatively skewed. So A, standard deviation will be underestimated. Um, this will be correct. And basically what this is telling us um, is we're gonna have more downside risks than we really think. Because a lot of these observations are happening over here, um, and they're not that far from the mean, it makes the standard deviation not as big, um, but then we can have these huge downside um, risks in the tail here. So the standard deviation looks um, not as bad as it is, or uh, it makes the risk look lower than it may be. Uh, B, there is a lower probability of extreme returns. So this is gonna be kurtosis, not skew what kurtosis describes, not skewness, probability of extreme returns is kind of is skewed to the negative, but it doesn't um, tell us a whether the probability of those extreme returns is higher or lower. And then C, there is a lower frequency of positive deviations from the mean. Um, there's actually going to be a higher frequency of positive deviations from the mean, which is what makes this skewed. So most of our the, most of our observations occur over here. Um, in this kind of narrower band positively, um, but then we have these big tails over here that kind of drags the mean back. So we can uh, rule out C as well and stick with answer A.